Now off we go. Hello, everyone. In the EDAP 585 class, I hope you 585ers have had a good week. Um, we're battening down the hatches here in Louisville, waiting for the big snowstorm. It's going to drop two inches, which I find hilarious. <clears throat> um, I have a friend, not friend, what am I saying? I have a niece who lives down in Chattanooga, and they had their school closed today because of flooding. Have you been getting all the rain there in Paris, uh, Stephen, as well, or the crazy thunderstorms? I mean, no, it, kind of it is a bit bad. It's just kind of sprinkled and drizzled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not too bad. Yeah. So you, of course, then I heard later this morning that Atlanta was under a tornado watch, and, you know, Chattanooga is just up the road from Atlanta. Wow. Crazy times. So last week, we looked at TPAC. Now, I, I sometimes get accused of being too much in, enamored in TPAC. And um, I think the takeaway from TPAC that I want you all to have is that it's a theoretical framework. In other words, it's what people who do research can use to frame their research around. And let me show you why. Um, when we talk about TPAC, what we're looking at is the um, image that I showed you last week. And I'm going to bring it up here in just a sec. That right there, the TPAC framework. And let me just spend just a little bit of time on this and we'll move on because what we're going to do tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about Tim and UDL. And really, Tim and TPAC have more of a relationship to each other than UDL. UDL is a standalone thing all to itself, but it doesn't take me long to explain UDL. Um, and it's more a curricular frame of mind than it is a framework. And we'll show you all that. But here's what I want you to take away from this. If you're a researcher, you're looking at this particular graphic, and you're looking at all the different intersections that this Venn diagram is showing us. And you may pick one of those intersections, and that then could form the basis of you doing research. So you might want to look at the technological pedagogical knowledge, which is the, inter the intersection between technology knowledge and pedagogical knowledge. And you might be looking at that, thinking about, okay, so what are the technologies that we see employed with the various pedagogies that we see employed? And what meanings do they have? In other words, do teachers pick certain pedagogies because they're using certain technologies? When you look at content knowledge, of course, that's the original work that all this is based upon is this interplay between content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge. And that's, of course, the Shulman work. And what he was trying to, to determine, and still to this day is still going on, research in this, is that people were looking at it and they were saying, okay, people who have strong content knowledge, who really know their stuff, do they have the ability to shift into different pedagogies. It's really an interesting field if you think about it, because you know, you'll say, well, if you're not very good with your content, you're not going to do a lot of pedagogical changes. You're not going to use a, a lot of pedag pedagogies in your teaching. People who are very comfortable in their content do a lot of pedagogical changes. What we were looking, are still looking at right now is, does con, is, there, is there a true causation between your content level of knowledge? In other words, how much, how well, well do you know your stuff? And how flexible you are in your pedagogy choices. And or what are the questions you ask to change pedagogies? In other words, is there, is, there, is there something happening? So are you using formative assessment and then 
at the end of your teaching? And then does it inform then how you might change the pedagogy that you're using? It's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in that very simple interplay right there. And that's why Shulman got so fascinated by it. And then, you know, our buddies come along and they start trying to figure out where does technology play in all this. So again, if you look at the Venn diagram where content knowledge and technological knowledge intersect, the TCK, what you could be looking at there would be, do people who have strong content knowledge, do they also have a flexibility in the technology they can use? Or do people who have content knowledge carry around a suite of tools that they can use um, to relay the technology and, or to relay the content using technology. This could be as simple. <laughs> this could be as simple as how well do you use technology, the actual hardware? How well do you use the PowerPoints that come with your curriculum? And then how do you integrate all that into a way that it draws kids into the content and gives them multiple ways of demonstrating their understanding? So TPAC is a classic. And I, I said th this to you last week, that when you look at theoretical frameworks in education anyway, um, they look like this. Now, I'm going to leave you one last thought, and then we'll, we'll leave the TPAC behind. See the big circle that surrounds all of it? It says the context. So the context is everything. Context is everything. So if I'm trying to teach something to students, what is my context? Am I trying to help them understand beginning definitions of vocabulary for whatever we're learning? Are we employing different ideas to demonstrate our understanding? Uh, activities, I meant to say, not ideas. Are we employing different activities to demonstrate our understandings? So context is everything. Do we always use technology in every single uh, area that we teach? Nope. No, you don't. And then the question that gets asked by researchers with this is, when do you and why do you? I was just with a group of uh, students who are in um, like a sophomore class here. We were talking today and they're all young enough to have known uh, a tool that's widely used in high schools called Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T. And it's a way for you to sit there with your phone and the teacher puts questions up on the screen and then you can log in and respond to the questions. It's fast becoming a cliche in classrooms that people use it because it gives you a reason for the kids to use their personal uh, Hardware that they carry around with them. But what's what's the purpose? What's the sense? We're using technology. The content is whatever is in the Kahoot. And what's the pedagogical reason for all of this? Why are we doing it? Well, well, formative assessment, pure and simple. But what it really is driving it, and that's what people should realize, the technology, the Kahoot. What it's really doing is it's doing a quick down and dirty acquisition of data. And that's where you want, that's how you want teachers to view this stuff. And so when you look at in the TPAC, when the guys talk about that teachers need the room, the time, the fail safe environment to playfully interact with their curriculum and technology, this is kind of what they're talking about to have those conversations about, so we're using a tool like this, why? Oh, because it's fun and the kids get to use their devices. No. <laughs> Bottom line is, is it's a way for us to gather data on 
what do people know and what don't they know other than a you know quiz all right i'm going to leave tpac behind now i hear a cheer out there in the great beyond from people now let's go look at this little background state of Florida was one of the th there were three states and I find this fascinating there were three states that were early adopters and earlier early um, right at the very beginning of technology use in schools four if you want to count this one they really didn't do all that much and the three were surprise surprise Florida Arkansas Tennessee and the fourth one was Kentucky and they're all in the south I find that so interesting Tim was a re reaction to a way of looking at how does technology and the teaching, the pedagogy fit together. That's why it's called technology integration matrix. So it is going to be looking at technology use. Remember last week I told you that when you look at TPAC, it's kind of looking more at the interplay between content and pedagogy and how technology fits into that these guys basically say that they're looking at what is technology doing in that classroom now i'm not going to use this when i'm showing you because it's too hard to see frankly um university of south florida is the one who basically came up with this um and let me see if this is the one i want to look at this is okay so when you look at this what we're trying to, to get at here is let's put on our TPAC lenses for just a second and remember what TPAC was talking about. So TPAC was trying to look at the interplay between content, pedagogy, technology. I think what the Tim tries to do is it tries to say, let's look at the interplay of technology and different pedagogies and so it actually defines some pedagogies and it puts it in a matrix that going from left to right uh, is a sort of entry point and then it comes out to a transformational point and when you go down the left hand side what you see are these different ways of looking at the technology use and so the first one is active students are engaged in using technology rather than passively receiving information from the technology kids are out there um, actively using their computers their devices versus a teacher just showing powerpoints and then you come down to collaborative students use technology tools to collaborate with others rather than working individually uh, constructive this is a good one students use technology tools to connect new information to their prior knowledge and then authentic students use technology tools to link learning activities to the world and then goal directed students use technology tools to set goals plan activities monitor monitor progress and evaluate results Boom. so they basically have gone in and identified one two three four five and some of these what's fascinating is some of these have their groundings in research done by other people so when you see things like um, Wiggins and McTeague's work that they did with 
UBD, understanding by design, what they believe should be this authentic because their little mantra is all education is about is acquisition, understanding, which I call demonstrations of understanding, and then transfer. Transfer to meaning uh, authentic uses of what you've learned. There's really not a whole lot to go into with this because it's so straightforward. And this link that I have in here is self-explanatory because if you click on it, it actually takes you in and shows you things. So when you look at all these active learning, you can see that the first level, which would not be a good level, is just passively received. Um, and they might be using Kahoot to do, <laughs> to do some drill and practice activity. And then you've got a teacher may be the only one using actively using technology. But the kids are using technology but it's just drill and practice, drill and kill. And then you've got the settings arranged for direct instruction and individual work. Any student access to technology resources is limited and highly regulated. So, oh, they flipped it here. So in this one, this would be the least and this would be the most. When we get into uh, the Google Classroom next week, we will really get into how the Tim fits into the Google Classroom. And yeah, they did, they flipped it. The other thing I like about this tool is it does give you some examples down here of people who are, are doing things that look like this. One of the things that um, we have been trying to do for years and years and years is have teachers self-report their use of technology in their classroom as a way of helping us understand where the disconnects come in. And Tim is a tool that was created that was an outgrowth of, of that idea. In other words, what we used to have teachers do is sit down and go through a survey and I self identify. I know how to. So take take a word document. I know how to open a word document, how to put in text, how to save. And believe it or not, that those are three things that, that we ask people to report back on. And then the whole idea of it was is that teachers, the principal of the school would receive that information that was all given anonymously, by the way. And then they could sit down and plan for, for the for professional development. What we found with that kind of thing was, was that was very mechanistic. It was like, okay, so you know how to fill in the blank. But what was missing was this whole idea about how does it relate to the pedagogy or to kids use in classroom. And so whereas TPAC looks very much as a teacher focus on technology, the TIM is very much focused on the learning environment. Uh, let's see. Excuse me while I turn something off. There we go. I, I to me the, the Tim is very straightforward. It's just it's just straight up what it is. And what we're going to be using it for is when we go to start the uh, assignment for this particular module, and we'll do that tonight. 
is what I want you to be thinking is as you go through looking for videos, you're going to be looking to see if you can find one that represents Tim and you're going to be looking at this matrix to see where it fits. And so when we get over into that, I think I can do a better job of showing you what I mean by it. So let me put Tim aside for a second. And let's dive into this. This is called UDL. TPAC is a theoretical framework. It's used primarily to identify areas for research. TIM is very much a framework used by practitioners um, to evaluate technology use in classrooms. UDL is a belief structure. It has nothing to do with theoretical and conceptual frameworks. It is very much a belief construct. And it's a very simple one. And this is how I can sum it up in just one very simple uh, sentence. Multiple pathways in to the benefit of all. That's UDL. UDL was created uh, out of Harvard University by a gentleman by the name of David Rose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on this. This is their website that they created. It's been around for a while. It was uh, original research was done in the 1990s by David Rose. Uh, David is a neurologist. And what he was fascinated by, and if you watch the videos, he talks about this a lot, is he was fascinated by how when we did certain things, how different parts of our brain lit up. And so what he was trying to get at was, is how do we have those parts of the brain light up, all three of these different parts of the brain light up, so that real learning can go on. But he goes on to say that because the brain is so amenable that if we just find the right pathway in, then the limits for learning are, are almost unlimited. All right, let's back up and go look at this. So he divides the way our brain works into three networks, the affective, the recognition and the strategic. Um, the affective network is the engagement network. When we are learning, is what we're learning, is it interesting? Is it motivating me? Is it stimulating me? And if, those, if that is in place, then the rep representation part of my brain is basically looking at the information I'm receiving and then looking into my repository of information that I have here in the representation area of my brain. And it's making new connections. You know, it's kind of like what Larry Rosen was talking about, how we have these new connections that we put together in our brain when we have new information. In the representation part of your brain, the new information becomes important to you because it makes a connection to prior learning. If something you learn doesn't have a prior learning connection, and Mayer in his work about how people learn, then it doesn't go into your long-term memory and goes poof and goes away because you have a limited capacity of, of holding stuff in your head in that part of your brain that is where your sight and your sound, your vision, your hearing, put new information together. If that doesn't get connected to prior knowledge, it goes poof. It doesn't last. Now, what Dr. Rose found was that when people are presented with new information, 
that do not have a repository of prior understanding or prior information, then this part of the brain doesn't line up. This part of the brain is basically going, okay. And it doesn't have the ability to connect to that information to anything else. So therefore it just kind of slides on through. And then the last one is the how. And this is, I think, one of the most important parts of UDL. It says, for strategic goal-directed learners, differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. Oh boy, is that a biggie. You see this all the time. I think more and more we're, we're seeing it. Um, project-based learning is a huge, and if you haven't caught on to this class yet, it's all about project-based learning. So project-based learning basically says that if you allow people multiple ways of doing demonstration of their understanding, you engage them. And if the information you're providing to them is enough that they make connections, then they can form new ideas. And then those new ideas become the information that they demonstrate to you in what other project they're doing, be it something as straightforward as um, being able to explain it to another student, being able to draw it, being able to write about it, being able to create a PowerPoint or a slides presentation, being able to make a movie, so on, so on, so on. Let me get an example of all this. I have a dear friend, brother from another mother, who um, I've known forever, and he has a son who was born with Down syndrome. And that's how I started as a, as a teacher. Actually, I started as a researcher working with a Down syndrome babies. Yes, babies. Um, we took children in as early as three months up to three years. And we worked with the children, we worked with the parents. And what we were trying to show to the parents was that the acquisition of understanding, in other words, the middle piece, the representation, in our children, when I say our children, I mean children with Down syndrome, that it was there, that it was actively happening, that there wasn't anything wrong with that part of the brain. It's, it was still sucking in stuff and trying to make sense of it. Where we saw the breakdown was in the, the how. And a lot of that had to do with physical things. You know, if you have a, uh, genetically a large tongue, it inhibits you being able to develop clear speech. And so people think you don't know anything because you don't express it well. We found, and we did, boy, we did a lot of data gathering. We found the engagement level was still there. But we also found that due to um, the hypotonic nature of their bodies, in other words, their, their muscle, muscle development is very flabby. Uh, that's a characteristic of someone with Downs. People used to think it's because um, they didn't exercise. Well, chicken and the egg. But we found if we could convince parents that we're not going to break their kids <laughs> and have them through play actively engage them in things like holding up their head, um, one of the things that I would demonstrate to parents was swinging with their kids. Think about when you swing, all the things your body is doing. And one of my biggies, because I come from a background of outdoor recreation, um, was teaching kids to swim. There is no better way to teach body awareness and put somebody into a pool of water. I'm not saying throw a kid in and uh, tell them, well, sink or swim. I'm saying about putting a kid in, in a safe situation where they're not underwater, they can stand up in it uh, about to their neck and they can then interact with the water and feel it around them and, and feel their muscles. 
And because of that support, your your body just sort of automatically just starts wiggling and squiggling around. And of course, you make it fun. So this young man, that was my dear friend, um, was blessed by having two parents who truly believed in the idea that there were no limits. And so he was always, always placed in regular classrooms from kindergarten on. And it just seemed, they would tell me, they, would, they said it just seemed that he kept having, it was becoming harder and harder and harder for him to keep up as, as he moved through school. And the question I kept asking was, where is the hard? In other words, is it in the representation part? Is he just not getting it? Well, no, he can read and he can do math. Okay. So where's the hard part? Well, when he goes to take the test and stop there. So as an expression, the how of learning, he doesn't do that very well. Right. Yeah, he doesn't. Is it because he has test phobia? We don't know why. Fair enough. Is he engaged? Oh, yes. He loves to learn. He loves to learn. Roll the tape forward. He's in high school. And he's expressing a desire to take AP classes in high school to his parents. Advanced placement. And his parents are good people, but they're still struggling with this idea. Now, by this time, um, David has become enamored with something called iMovie, which you may have heard of. Uh, it was a tool that was available on the Macintosh, still is, that allowed people to make movies. And he, he was fascinated by it. And then he was fascinated by something called YouTube that came along uh, in the early days. And we were sitting around talking one day and he said, you know, I love to cook. I said, yep, you do. You do love to cook. He said, I would like to make a YouTube channel and call it Cooking with Dave. So his father's sitting there and he's looking at me and he's going, how can he do all of this? But yet, if he were taking an AP class, he couldn't do the AP test. It takes us to a tenant of Universal Design for Learning. And that tenant is this, this belief is this. The child is not broken. The curriculum is broken. It isn't that David couldn't understand the ideas of this history class that he wanted to take. It was the structure of the class would not allow David to do a demonstration of understanding. It only had one way. Multiple pathways in to the benefit of all. So they met with the high school AP teacher, good guy. And they said, could David sit in your class? And he said, well, he's, will he interrupt my class? Oh, no. No, no, he won't. Uh, they said he might need to bring a device in to record what you say because his ability to write notes is limited. He just had poor fine motor control. Oh, okay, that'd be fine. What are we going to do about the test? Will he just sit out? Then David spoke up. He said, could I do something else other than a test? And he said, sure. He said, how about if I allow you to do, use the research part of the class as your test? In other words, not take the AP test, but still get a grade off the research paper. David kind of sat there and he said, I, I don't write well. I know how to write, but he says, I don't write well. Can I do try another way? The guy said, sure. So here was, here was the research they had to do. They had to pick a topic of American history from the end of World War I through the end 
of um, well, 1960. David chose the growth of jazz. He loves music. And so he sat down and he put together a 30 minute iMovie that showed the growth of jazz with examples, with pictures, with explanations, all the way through from the end of World War I to 1960. Got an A because he met every single criteria of the research paper the other students are going to have to do. He cited his sources. He demonstrated his understanding of the growth, the impact. He did all the things that was required in the rubric. We talked one time about, want to try to take the test? <laughs> And he said, well, if I took the test, how would I know how to take the test? And I said, well, David, you already know how to do stuff. You know how to study. You know how to memorize things. He goes, I don't have a good, I, I don't have good memory. He says, I have good ways of doing things. He said, then I remember. Fair enough. Now, in the videos that you may watch, and I hope you will watch, um, Dr. Rose uses a young man uh, who is uh, cerebral palsy. And I have also worked with a lot of CP kids. And again, one of the things that, I, that they find, and they will tell you that is so frustrating for them, is the fact that their what of learning is not affected. And if they are engaged, the why of learning is not affected. It's the how. So if we can think about giving people different ways of demonstrating their understandings, then we have succeeded in what Wiggins and McTeague would talk about in terms of acquisition, understanding, transfer taking in information, making sense of it, and then transferring it to a real world situation or product. My friend's son, David, um, after he graduated from high school, came here to UofL to be a, a participant in a program we do here called PACT, P-A-C-T. And I don't know what that acronym stands for, to be quite honest with you. But he grew very frustrated with the program. And the reasons were he wasn't learning anything new. He was just here. He was just walking around campus and they would allow him to go. He wanted to go sit in on classes, but people did not want him to be a distraction in their classes. He was so thirsty. He was so wanting to learn things. So one day he announced that he wanted to be a movie star and everybody smiled to themselves and said, that's nice, David. And his dad was sitting in my office here and he was talking to me and he was looking around. And if you've never been in my office, it's sort of a, well, if you're easily distracted, you'd have a hard time in it because it's so full of all kinds of stuff. Some people call it junk. <laughs> I call it artifacts. So he was sitting there and he said, David is just hung up on this idea about being in a movie. And I said, why does that surprise you? He had a YouTube channel called Cooking with Dave. And his dad kind of looked at me and he sh said, you're right. I said, so maybe we're, we're coming at this from the wrong way. Instead of trying to explain to David why he cannot, maybe we should be looking for ways that Maybe he could. So he went out the door and he started doing research, looking around. And lo and behold, he found that there were avenues for people with special needs to become involved in commercials and so on. 
So he started putting feelers out. And then, of course, when Dave found out what he was doing, he said, I can do that. And so he started putting them out. And then one came across the, the wire that said that it was a movie that was being created and financed by a group of people here locally in Louisville. But they were doing a nationwide search for uh, the actor to do the role um, with a disability. In fact, when they sh when we were sitting down looking at it, they made a very big point about um, the Dustin Hoffman movie, movie, you know, where he portrayed a person with autism and how they did not want to do that. They wanted to make sure that their movie actually had someone portraying in it that actually had whatever the condition was. And the condition, very quickly, they hadn't defined the condition either. It could have been cerebral palsy, autism. And they finally settled on Down syndrome. And so they requested everybody to do an audition tape. So his dad comes to me and says, what the heck's an audition tape? And I said, I think I know what it is because I have a background in working with media. And I said, but let me ask my friend who teaches here at a local high school, who's also a card carrying member of the Screen Actors Guild as an actor and as a director. Why is he teaching at a high school, Steve? Because he wanted to give back. That's another whole story. I said, let me see if he'd be willing to help us with this. So we got together here in this building that I'm sitting in right now in the mail room because it had a nice, you know, big opening. And they sent David the script that they wanted them to read. And uh, then we filmed it. Now, here's, here's the irony of this whole story. So I'm legally blind, in case you don't know that. And so as a part of the script, I was reading the part of the story. Oh, I haven't told you the story. So the story is about a baseball player who is sort of a washed out baseball player. His, his wife has left him. Um, he's become an alcoholic. And he has a daughter who doesn't like him because she, she, th she thinks he let her down. And he meets a young man in a grocery store. And the young man, through their interactions, he becomes, he realizes what is really important in life. There you go. Simple explanation. So the scene that they wanted the audition tape was about uh, the young man in the grocery store talking to this baseball player who is in the store, hungover, trying to get some groceries together because he woke up and he looked around. And there was nothing to eat in his house. So they're over in the produce aisle. And this young man had a nickname in the grocery store, Produce, because he had this uncanny ability to know all the different codes on the produce and what it meant. And so the scene is they're standing there and he's talking to him and the guy at first is annoyed by this um, disabled kid bothering him, but he's not out, outright hostile to him. And the kid is saying, can I help you find anything? He says, I don't know what I'm looking for. Or not. Just let me look around. He goes, well, let me help you. And he picks up a piece of fruit. He tosses it to him. And he said, if you look on that piece of fruit, it's code, da, 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 whatever, whatever. And he said, that means that it's an orange that's been grown in California. He says, now this piece of fruit that he picks up and tosses to him, that code on that, and he rattles off the code, tells you that it was grown in Florida. And he goes through this sort of routine of all these different things. Now, the point of this is in the video, you're just seeing David doing a straight on shot of him. David's already memorized his lines. He can read. So in the shot, he has just a table in front of him with some fruit. It was apples, oranges, bananas, you know, stuff. There was a pineapple, just stuff sitting there. He's supposed to be tossing it to the baseball player who's off camera. And then you hear the baseball player talking to him about, yeah, that's what it says on the fruit. Really? That means it's from California. Now, David is tossing this to, to someone who is, has a hard time seeing things and catching things. So in the audition tape, you see him pick up the fruit and you see him throw it 
and you then you hear it hitting the wall. There was a there was also a cabinet nearby, so it was hitting the cabinet, making a big clang noise. Especially now, some things the off camera person did catch. I did catch those things, but the best one was the pineapple. When he threw the pineapple, he actually threw the pineapple overhand, and like a football. And, and I had it in my hand, but then it bounced off and slammed into the to the locker. David didn't miss a beat. He kept the line going. He got picked. And at the first reading, in other words, the first run through of the script, um, the director and everyone who was involved in the project, they were very concerned and they said, now, David, if you need someone to help you read the script, we can bring somebody in. He says, I don't need any help. He says, I've already read it. He says, in fact, I have some questions. Can we go to page five? And they all fell out of their chairs. Multiple pathways in. To the benefit of all. That's UDL. Simple as that. We know through brain research. This isn't some good feeling kumbaya stuff that our brains have parts of it that handle the representation, where we store our information. And if we help kids make the connections, then that representation grows in our brain. If we don't make the connections, then it literally just goes away. Think about something you had to know that did not become a part of your knowledge base that you could then fall back on when you had to learn something else. It quickly dissipates. It quickly goes away. Give you a perfect example. Uh, I was putting in, what was I putting in today for you all today? Oh, I was putting in the, the Tim PDF. And the Tim PDF, um, to put it into Blackboard, there is a series of steps you have to go through in Blackboard. So the PDF isn't just a link. It actually exists in front of you. Show you what I mean. Um, and since I don't do that every single day, I have to stop and think. How do I go about putting this in right here? How do I go about putting this in to my Blackboard space? Now, when I go back and I look in my knowledge base, and in there, I remember the steps from before when I did it for something else. It's a very straightforward little process you have to go through. The how. So what if I hadn't been able to remember how to do it? I have. I remember that there is this video. And this video is this lady who is showing how to do this. And so if I can't remember it, I have a connection in my brain that says, go YouTube it and put in posting PDFs to Blackboard. In other words, it's just a phrase. Multiple pathways in to the benefit of all. Does it hurt anything in our classrooms to allow for different expressions and actions? I find when I do UDL, because uh, one of the things that we teach a lot of around here is differentiated learning, the Tomlinson stuff. And we twist and we bend and we, you know, to try to figure out how to fit Tomlinson into reality. <laughs> and the reality is you have 28 kids in a classroom. And so the differentiation is I'm going to do this for these four kids one way, do this another way for these five kids, do this another way for these three kids. And oh my God, I got that one guy sit still. 
UDL says, can we find a way that engages someone in a expression or an action that demonstrates what they know? And the what then follows. Over and over and over again, I've seen this. High school physics teacher, just extraordinarily good high school physics teacher, who had the comprehensive physics class. <laughs> and she's trying to teach Newton's laws of motion. Now, in most classes, what do you do? You basically teach them, give them a test, they spit it back out at you. And if you get it right, fine, move on. In her class, she went through the process of this is what he means when he says a, an object at rest has a tendency to stay at rest. Get your hands on it, do it, experience it. And then she had a project at the end where they had to pick one of the laws and do a demonstration of it. In a way that was reality based. When I used to teach uh, science to fifth graders, because what I would do is I would come in and I would teach the science and I would bring my special needs students with me because they had no trouble understanding the science. They had no trouble understanding the science. They had no trouble with the what. If you explained it well. And then the engagement piece was, let's do sabool with the what. And then the how piece was, let's have multiple ways of doing the demonstration to the benefit of all. Simple stuff. Simple stuff. But don't think for a second that I don't think that it's easy to do. But once you do it and once you see that learning has no limits, then you'll never go back to it again. I remember the, uh, the night that they had the premiere of David's movie out at uh, Tinseltown. And he invited all of his former teachers to come to the movie. Oh, but the movie is called, by the way, Where Hope Grows, Where Hope Grows. I always tease my friend. Um, they made their money back. I said, but really, you'll know that uh, you've made it when it shows up on Hallmark Channel. But everybody who came to the movie that night, of course, they all were just amazed at <laughs> that, that kid they had had in their class, what he did. And he got up and he said, he said, you know, he said, I want to thank all of you for believing in me. That was this. And that's all he said. Not because he didn't have more. Uh, David now works as the national spokesman, the national spokesman for Down syndrome. Um, he gets flown all over the place and he gives speeches and he talks about David's gift. David's gift. He's very self-reflective. He knows he's different. And he tries to get people to understand that the differences don't matter. Um, David's curse, frankly, is he's self-reflective. He's self-aware. And as he gets older, it's becoming more frustrating for him. Um, you know, as someone, I didn't grow up with an intellectual disability. I grew up with a physical disability. 
he and I connect at a very uh, visceral level. You know, I, I try to help him understand his frustrations. And I help him try to see that what he's done, the vast majority of us can't even imagine doing. I mean, he, if you get him to sit down and talk to you, he can give you a whole dissertation. And I'm, I'm very aware of the word I just used. Whole dissertation on how movies are done. Continuity. Staging. So on and so on. UDL. Universal Design for Learning. All right. So let's jump back look at what we're I'm asking you to do and I'm sorry I didn't spend a lot of time with Tim I think Tim is very self-explanatory <laughs> you walk in a classroom you sit down and you look around and is there technology being used in the classroom and where does it fall within these levels um, it's as simple I think it's very straightforward. So what are we asking you to do to do your demonstration of understanding? Well, we're giving you quite a lot of resources. We're going to use a tool called Blend Space. And Blend Space allows you to create these really nice little um, presentations that is your way of showing your understanding. Uh, this, this TES Teach is one of these things where they have a multitude of tools. I like their blend space, frankly, over just about everything they have. Um, we'll be talking about a tool when we get down into the tool section of this class that is very, 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 very much based upon UDL. I'll let you be surprised by that one. But I'm going to go in and create a new lesson. And I'm going to give it a title. Just like when we did the infographic, always, always give it a title. So if you want to be very precise, you can call it your name, and you can call it your uh, T Pack Tim UDL demo. Okay. Or you can call it the alphabet soup. Come up with the title, but put a title there. Otherwise, you'll lose it. In other words, if you at the point you've made the title, you've now saved your work. <clears throat> okay. The resources allow you to put multiple things in here. Your resources are over here on this side of the page. Now you notice each box has the same kind of thing. Drop a resource, add text, add a quiz. So you can do this. Um, in social studies about uh, da, 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 10 years ago, one of the tools that everybody was really excited about was something that was called a curation box, where you went out and you found artifacts that you would put into it wasn't quite a diorama. It was more like, well, look at this thing. You could see it. You have a box that's divided into six little compartments. And each compartment then would represent something about what it was that you were demonstrating that had to do with social studies. So it, it might be a cultural artifact. It might be a, a, an artifact that represented the food that the culture might eat, an artifact that might represent the culture, and you'd put it in the different boxes. Well, what they tried to do with this is they tried to bring that into the technological age. And let me show you how that happens. But first, let me jump back 
and give you an understanding of where your resources to do this lie. So when we look at the module, at the top level of the module, it has in it a link that takes you to uh, CEHD resources. I mean, sorry, I had to scroll through all this stuff. Okay. So we're going to be looking at this by using this wiki right here, TPAC CEHD. So if you click on that link, it will take you to a page that I have created about TPAC, or a wiki, I should say. And in here, I have a list. I have the basic breakdown with videos of what Tim, TPAC, UDL are all about. But if you look over here, you'll see that in the pages, we have a page under Navigator. We have a page called Technology in the Classroom Videos. Click on that. And now you'll see that we have, I don't know if plethora is the right word, cornucopia. How about just a whole lot? We've got a whole lot of videos here. In fact, there's so many, it takes a while for them to all load in. And what I'm asking you to do is to go through and look at these videos. It doesn't take you long because if you've got a good grounding in your head about what you think um, TPAC, TIM, and UDL are all about, it's pretty straightforward. So like if you come up here, we look at an elementary math classroom observation. All right, let's click on it. Third grade math lesson. Now, I'm not going to let you listen to her because you can't. I'm just going to kind of give you a sense of what's going on in here. So what we're looking for here is the different ways that these different ideas that we have been looking at are demonstrated. When you look here, what are we actually seeing here? A lot of talking. There's some manipulation. And then, oh boy, the UDL just kind of screams at you, doesn't it? What's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? What's that guy doing? Are they engaged? Do they have different ways of doing their demonstration? TPAC. Is there any technology employed here? Actually, there is, if you look at it. The markers and the whiteboards, that's technology. Doesn't have to be a computer. That's, what, that's technology. Is it connected to the content? Or are we doing pretty scribbles? <laughs> what pedagogy is involved here? Let's look at another one. Oh, there's, oh, good. They've all loaded in. Good. So your job is, is you want to Watch the videos and look for examples of the three different frameworks that we've looked at here. So this gentleman is explaining to us how he's using technology in his classroom for kids to understand graphs and their relationship to data. Um, I'm not giving it away, but I think if you watch this video, you really start seeing TPAC in action. Now, let me show you a couple more, and then I'm going to give you the uh, your frame, if you will. So here's a gentleman teaching math with iPads. An obvious technology. Oh, it's got music. It, it, if it 
was a selling thing they were doing. Oh, look, he's using a smart board with rolling dice. Okay, and he's got Google Drive. Boy, that one just screams technology at you. But if you keep watching it all the way through, does it also scream content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge? Look at some of these where kids are doing things with technology. And then think about that in terms of the Tim. So if you're going to look at things with Tim, you need to think about it in terms of, is there even technology employed? This is one of my favorite ones. Not because it's a good one, by the way. Oops. So we get the beginning of it, which is first grade teacher and so and so on, is using technology and now you know what the next thing is going to be. They're going to go to a guy who's going to go, well, hey, I wouldn't know how to use any of this stuff, but this guy in his classroom sure does. There we go. Tech savvy students. Okay. You can skip through that. Now, get to the point where they're actually using it. Now, this is a great Tim exercise right here. Watch this video and see how it fits, how it would work in the Tim. So what are we doing? So what I'm going to ask you to do is very straightforward and very simple. If you click on these and they start to play, and then if you click on the YouTube link, go up here and grab the URL of the YouTube link, and you're going to copy that. Now, this is because you have decided this is one of three videos that you want to use. And in your blend space, what you can do is over here where it says search YouTube. If you just put in that URL and then hit return, it will bring it to you. Okay. And you can drag it over and drop it in to your wonderful blend space that you're going to use. Okay. That's simple. Then you go find another one, put it in here, drag it over. Find another one, put it in here, drag it over. Then below it, this is where you do the work. You're going to explain to me how this video represents the TPAC, the TIM, the UDL. Or, because the negative is just as strong, how it is a violation, how it does not represent the TPAC the TIM, or the UDL. Okay. So let's do it again, just so we're sure. So we have a link that will take us to a place where Steve has tons and tons and tons of videos. Um, some of these are KTIP videos, for those of you who know what KTIP is which is very interesting because one of the things that we would always look at when we looked at K-TIP videos was the um, use of technology. The only thing I also find this interesting that these K-TIP videos, and you'll see this when you click on them, they're in YouTube. I sure hope they had uh, permission from everybody. So if we go to the link that is actually where that is from, and we grab it by copying the link. We come into our space and we search for video just by throwing it in there. Okie doke. That one come in. How about we just do a search? Hmm.
that's not good. I don't know why that's doing that, to be honest with you. Um, if I just did... I think the first time you forgot to hit, I think the first time you forgot to click copy, the first time you try to do it. You think that's what it is? Yeah. Try, try okay. pasting it again. Try pasting it again. Okay. Okay. So it's my stupidity. <laughs> it's not that it doesn't work. All right. Fine. So you're dragging your resources into the upper box. You're explaining about it in the lower box. And as I said, if you can find one that is a bad example, you go right ahead and use it. Um, there, there are more good examples than there are bad examples. Let's just put it that way. But boy, when they're bad, they are bad. And I tried to find as many as I could that, you know, went across content areas. Um, I think, you know, some of these um, screen UDL, that one, to give you a hint. Okay. So we're finding the videos that we want to use. We're putting them into our blend space. We are then writing about them below as to how they work in terms of do they represent TPAC, TIM, and UDL. Um, with the TIM, what I think you can do with the TIM is they all are going to represent TIM. What you're going to say in TIM is here is how they work. In other words, are, is it actively or passively? Um, how within the matrix does this particular lesson, where would it fall? So now the question is, what do I do with it? Well, when you get it done, ta -da, it's as simple as that. You come in here and you basically are going to copy your lesson link, make sure you get it all, and then you uh, copy it, paste it into the assignments, just like we've been doing. It's as simple as that. Now, one of the things that is interesting is you can embed a blend space, and it will show up wherever you've embedded it, and it will, in other words, the whole blend space shows up. The link just takes you back, so it works as well. The other thing that's interesting is you can take a blend space and you can drop it straight over into a Google Classroom, which is really kind of cool. Um, if you look, these are all the different classes that I belong to or that I own. And if I wanted to, I could take my blend space and I could drop it into one of these. We'll come back to this when we do Google Classroom. There is so much to Google Classroom now um, that just makes to me, it just makes all the sense in the world to use it. Okay, Steve, what did I miss? What did I mess up? Anything? Do I need to go back over anything? I'm with you so far. I think you're good. Okay. So let me just refer, let me just do it one last time. So we're looking at TPAC. When we're looking for a video about TPAC, and I sure hope everybody's watched that by now. What we're doing is we're looking to see an example of where we see pedagogy content being supported by technology or, or the reverse, the negative. Well, here's pedagogy and content, but there's no technology use. And there's one in there that's just a hoot um, because the level of technology use is so high, but the pedagogy, the pedagogy and the content are so low that it just screams out at you. And I'll tell you what, next week before we move on, we'll debrief and I'll show you my faves and what I think are the best and the worst of those videos. Tim, all you're doing with Tim, pick any one of the videos. You know, if you find one where there's a lot of technology employed, fine. If not, fine. And just go through and then basically in your, in your explanation, 
you can say, when I look at the Tim matrix, this is where I see this lesson falling within the matrix. Simple as that. UDL is a little more nuanced because what we're looking for when we look for an example of UDL is, do kids have multiple ways of demonstrating what they're learning? Do they have multiple ways of experiencing what's going on in the classroom? So there's, there's less about content and pedagogy and more about it. pedagogy. Does it allow for multiple pathways in for kids and demonstrations of their knowledge? Are there multiple ways for them to demonstrate? I think I've got it covered. Um, as I said, if you will please take the time to watch these videos that I have in here. Now I try to be very good about putting in videos that don't last very long. Uh, the UDL one from CAST, this will explain it to you in four minutes. If I've done a poor job, well, this will do a much better job. So that one, um, if you don't get it, it's right there. The Tim, I, you know, I keep doing this and I, I've got to come up with either, I can't find a good movie, frankly, to do Tim, but I think it's just daggone straightforward. Uh, at what level is the, the stuff that we're using the technology? Is it entry? Is it adoption? Is it adaption? Is it uh, infusion? Is it transformational? Is it active learning? In other words, you could have this going on. In other words, you could have this le learning types going on here, environments, but yet it would be entry level. I mean, that's the whole point of Tim. Um, and there is one video in there. I'll tell you this. There's one video in there that is uh, transformational. <clears throat> it blows the top off of everything. And then UDL, multiple pathways in, uh, multiple demonstrations of understanding to the benefit of all. Okay, that's all I've got. I uh, hope everybody has a good day tomorrow. We're supposed to get snow tonight, Tim, uh, Steve. And already the college is abuzz and people are wanting to leave class early, even though the snow is not going to come in until after midnight. And I've already been asked by students walking by my office, do I know if the university will be open tomorrow? Snow is such an interesting event. <laughs> Not just a weather event, but a cultural event. As always, excuse me, <clears throat> I'd take a drink. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, you know how to reach me. 502-457-2937. Uh, um, if there's something that you need to here again, if you need to literally have a one-to-one -one with me, we use our good friend, the Collaborate. Um, and you and I can come in here together. Uh, we can see Steve right now down here in the lower right. But if, if Steve wanted to show me what is on his screen, it's very simple to do. I make him a moderator. He jumps through the hoops that I jump through to share my screen with you. So if you're having a problem and you need to have that one-to-one -to, -one to walk through, is this right, Steve? Will you please look at this? I'll be happy to do it. Otherwise, everybody have a good, good Thursday. Happy Friday for tomorrow. Uh, I'll be back in here uh, tomorrow with a four-hour training session with people on Google uh classroom certification and next week yay next week we'll probably sit on the google for about two to three classes because i really do want you to understand it and i hope i can talk you into uh taking the google test i think it has become i know in all the counties here uh surrounding jefferson it is the way of managing your classroom with technology it hasn't been dictated yet because we don't have a one-to-one -one in every school and i think what's happening is is that the school district is trying to figure it out now in some school districts it is uh mandatory because they are not necessarily one-to-one -one, but everybody has a cart full of um, chromebooks that they can bring into their classroom so we're probably going to sit on the Google Classroom for about three classes because there's a lot to cover there that I want you to know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. I, I appreciate you keeping me company on these Thursday nights. 
um, as always, you know, you don't have to be away from the fam. You can go home and just do this, you know, either at home on a on another computer or through your phone. And I will get those links fixed. Boy, I'm glad we kind of did that tonight. I'll get that fixed right now. Okay, my friend? All right. Thank you. Good job. Tell hi to your mom for me. Yes, sir. Have a good night. Bye.